that involves the two of us and that he should know what she's talking about. Donna Adelson says, this TV is probably about $5,000. Donna Adelson tells Charlie Adelson that the man who approached her mentioned an ex-girlfriend. Donna Adelson never says which ex-girlfriend. She never says Catherine Magmanawa's name to Charlie Adelson in that phone call. She only says that the blackmailer mentioned an ex-girlfriend. Charlie Adelson never asked whose ex-girlfriend or which ex-girlfriend. Who are they talking about? He never asked that. After this phone call with his mother, Charlie Adelson then calls the defendant. He does not call his most recent ex-girlfriend or even the ex-girlfriend before that. No, he calls this defendant. And his call to Catherine Magdanois is the only call he makes to an ex-girlfriend after getting this information from his mother. And he had not dated Catherine Magdanois for a year and a half at this point. He never calls any other ex-girlfriend and never talks to anyone else about the man approaching his mom and trying to blackmail her, except for his family and this defendant, Catherine Magbanwa. He never calls the police to report that his mother has been extorted, and he never calls Garcia or Rivera. You all will hear the calls between Charlie Adelson and the defendant, and as you listen to these, you'll notice that the two of them are being very careful about what they say. It's apparent that you know, the people involved in this conspiracy are very smart, and they are immediately suspicious that the other could be wearing a wire, or law enforcement could be listening to these conversations. <clears throat> So next, Charlie Adelson and the defendant met in person at a restaurant called Dolce Vita. And while they sat at their table in this busy, noisy restaurant, an undercover FBI agent sat at a table nearby. And uh, the agent had a camera, a hidden camera, and recorded the conversation. Their conversation can be very difficult to hear at times. Um, experts have tried to clarify the recording as much as possible and have succeeded in taking out most of the background noise, but the defendant was speaking very softly and her voice is still extremely difficult to hear. However, Charlie Adelson's voice is deeper, it's lower, it's a little louder, and it can be heard. And in the recording, we hear him discussing with her whether the man who walked up to his mother could be an undercover police officer, or someone trying to blackmail them. And if it's a blackmailer, is it just somebody trying to make a quick buck, or is it somebody who knows information? And you'll hear on the recording that Charlie Adelson reassures the defendant that if it's the police, that's a good thing. Charlie Adelson thinks that if it's the police, that means the police don't have enough no, evidence. No, 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 no. Overrule. That means the police don't have enough evidence to charge anyone. In fact, the, uh, Charlie Adelson tells her, if they had any evidence, we would have already gone to the airport. He starts giving her some legal advice. He says, in order to prove someone committed a crime, you have to be able to put the person at the scene at the time the crime was committed, which unfortunately for the defendant and Charlie Adelson is not an accurate statement of the law, as you'll see in the jury instructions. It's important to note that, you know, at the time that this conversation is taking place, you know, no arrests had been made at this point of Garcia or Rivera or any, of anyone. The only thing that the police had released to the public at that point was a photo of the Prius that was seen fleeing the scene. And it was the Prius that Garcia and Rivera had rented and used the day of Dan Martell's murder. So the only thing police had ever put out there is a photo of the Prius. Police knew at this point that Garcia and Rivera had rented the Prius, but the public didn't know that. 
public only had a photo. And you'll hear Charlie Adelson give the defendant several analogies about rental cars being used to commit crimes in this recording. He reassures her that if her DNA is found in a car, all that means is at one point she sat in a car. And that if that car was later used to commit a crime, police can't prove that just from her DNA being in a car. Charlie Adelson says that if a rental car is found that was at the scene of a crime, police also have to prove who was driving it at the time of the crime. And he gives her a very interesting hypothetical of her renting a car in Miami, someone asking to borrow it, driving to Orlando to commit a robbery, and how she would be innocent in that hypothetical because she wasn't in the car at the time of the robbery. So you all will be able to listen to these conversations and decide for yourselves whether Charlie Adelson was trying to reassure the defendant that you know, even if police are able to identify who rented that Prius that police had um, put out to the public as a photo of the car fleeing the scene, they still wouldn't have enough evidence to hold anybody responsible for the murder. Charlie Adelson continues to reassure the defendant about the lack of evidence. He let her know that, you know, basically as long as they stay quiet, they don't have anything to worry about. And he does that by explaining to her that crimes are tough to prove unless someone actually witnessed the suspect commit a crime or a suspect makes a confession or a suspect is caught on a wire talking about the crime. And at one point, Charlie Adelson points to out that, you know, that the money hasn't been used to buy anything flashy that would draw the attention of police. Charlie Adelson does this by asking her, let me ask you a question. When everybody was there the next day, and then he asks her about the money, and then he says, it's not like you're driving around in a Bentley or cruising around in a mega yacht. And you all will hear during the course of this trial why those statements are important why the question about the money and the next day is particularly important. Because the evidence will show that the defendant traveled to Charlie Adelson's residence the night of the murder. She picked up payment for the murder, the $100,000, and delivered payment to Garcia and Rivera the next day, the day after the murder. When discussing the possibility of whether there is actually a gangster here trying to blackmail his family, Charlie Adelson says, whoever this person is knows information. Charlie Adelson says there are two ways of dealing with this guy. They could call the police, they could do that, but then the guy blackmailing them would be charged with trying to blackmail his family, and the blackmailer would start talking and he would start calling out the defendant's name. And then police are gonna be asking questions about what happened. The other option <coughs> is to pay him, but let him know that this is a one-time thing and try to scare off the blackmailer by saying, if you come around again, we're gonna to go to the police. So Charlie Adelson gives the defendant very precise instructions to call the number that the blackmailer gave them with the article of Dan Markell and tell the blackmailer, my friends, meaning the Adelson family, my friends have no idea what you're talking about. And, and I don't have any idea what you're talking about either. But the name of the person who's incarcerated, that name you said does sound familiar. So I'm gonna give you the money as charity to help the less fortunate, but don't contact these people again or they will go to the police. And Charlie Adelson said he would give the defendant $5,000 to pay off the blackmailer. Charlie is concerned throughout this conversation that this guy is not going to go away, that he's gonna keep coming back for more and more money. And Charlie Adelson starts to let the defendant know what Sigfredo Garcia needs to do. Charlie, Charlie Adelson lets the defendant know that he is willing to pay whatever it takes for this guy to be killed. 
Charlie Adelson tells her that this guy is, and excuse my language, but I'm going to say what Charlie Adelson said in the recording. This guy is fucking with Fredo Garcia's wife, meaning the defendant. He's fucking with him, and you better kill him or he's going to be a big problem. He knows who you are. Charlie Adelson says, if he can't do it, have someone else do it. Charlie Adelson says, so help me God, if they fuck with my family, it's going to be Nazi shit because this will be done. I mean, Katie, I don't care what I spend. During this conversation, Charlie Adelson never says Sigfredo Garcia's name. He only refers to him as he and his. But the evidence will show that Charlie Adelson was talking about Sigfredo Garcia here and that that's what he wanted Sigfredo Garcia to do. Because next, Charlie Adelson checks with the defendant to make sure that Garcia has no hard feelings towards him, no reason that he wouldn't do this. He says, I have you on salary. Do you think you'd be happy about that? He says, our paths never crossed. I wasn't in the picture when you and him were together. Meaning Charlie Adelson didn't think he and Katie's relationship had any overlap with uh, Catherine Van Judge. Overruled. With Catherine Magdana and Garcia's relationship. After hearing that Charlie Adelson wants someone killed and is willing to pay whatever it takes to get it done, you can't hear much of what the defendant says, but you can tell that um, her tone doesn't change. She doesn't yell, whoa, whoa, what, what? She doesn't hop up from the table and get up and run out of the room. Overruled. She doesn't hop up from the table and get up and run out of the restaurant. Instead, the defendant then asked Charlie Adelson, she says, help me out. And Charlie Adelson says, he doesn't have to tell her the things that he'll do for her. He shows her what he does. She doesn't have to ask him for anything. He looks for things to do for her. He, he helps out when it's somebody's birthday. He helps her with her car problems. She doesn't have to ask. He looks for ways to help her. And throughout of Charlie Adelson's conversation with the defendant, Charlie Adelson would catch himself saying something a little incriminating, like at one point he says, why would this guy go to my mom? Why not go to me? That makes me think they only know part of the story. But then immediately says, but of course I had nothing to do with this. You know, I don't know, I don't know anything about this. Because he was very paranoid that the police could possibly be listening to these conversations, which was a valid concern because they were. What you won't hear in this recording is any explanation by Charlie Adelson to the defendant of why the police would be running an undercover operation on his family or why someone would be blackmailing his family. Charlie Adelson never has to explain that to the defendant, even though it seems like that would be the first thing that an innocent person would want to know and that we would hear an explanation for that. So call me Adelson. After meeting with this defendant, Charlie Adelson calls Donna Adelson to let her know that everything is fine. The defendant then asks Sigfredo Garcia to call the number from the paperwork. And you'll hear a number of calls between the defendant and Sigfredo Garcia and one in particular where she voices concern because what the blackmailer has said is getting too detailed. You'll have an opportunity, as I said, to hear these calls from this undercover operation. And when you listen to these calls, you'll see how, first of all, how information flows from Donna Adelson to Charlie Adelson, from Charlie Adelson to the defendant, from the defendant to Sigfredo Garcia. And in these calls, you'll hear the parties talking. And they're going to be using words like TV and false leads, listings, properties, clients, relationship advice, patients, board of dentistry, all these different terms that are normal terms, but they're used in context that if you're listening to the conversation, don't really make sense. And you all are going to determine the facts in this case. 
and you can decide whether these suspects are actually talking about being blackmailed or whether they're actually talking about TVs and relationship advice and real estate deals or whether they're actually talking about being blackmailed or investigated by the police and are talking in this code in case law enforcement may be listening. Throughout these calls, Donna Adelson, Charlie Adelson, the defendant, they're all hopeful that this guy, this blackmailer, is actually law enforcement just trying to get information. They think that if, law that if it's law enforcement, that means that the police don't have enough to bring charges. They're just trying to get information. They're just doing a fishing expedition versus the other possibility, which would be much worse for them that the Adelsons and the defendant are being blackmailed by someone who actually knows information about their roles in the murder of Dan Martell and may tell police what they know. So after this undercover operation, Luis Rivera and Sigfredo Garcia are arrested. Um, they're charged with the murder of Dan Martell Luis Rivera ended up cutting a deal with the state to provide information about the murder of Dan Markell and the people responsible for it. Rivera told law enforcement that he was hired by Sigfredo Garcia to help kill Dan Markell. Rivera described how Sigfredo Garcia told him that this defendant, Catherine Maybanoa, had set up a job for them in Tallahassee and it was going to pay $100,000, with Rivera's cut being $35,000. Rivera told law enforcement that the job was to kill a guy to help the Adelson family, specifically Wendy Adelson, get her kids back. Rivera explained that he and Garcia, he's telling law enforcement this, he and Garcia actually made two trips to Tallahassee with the intent of killing Dan Martell. <clears throat> the first one was a month before the murder, in June of 2014. And the second one was when Dan Martell was ultimately killed, in July of 2014. Rivera said that uh, for the June trip, uh, he bought a gun off the street, Garcia rented the car, and they drove to Tallahassee. They did some scouting on Dan Martell's uh, residence while they were here, but they ultimately could not get the job done that trip, and they ended up going back to Miami. Rivera said he asked Garcia, you know, who knows that I'm with you? Who knows we're up here doing this? And Garcia assured him that only the defendant knows. During the first trip to Tallahassee, Garcia showed Rivera a piece of paper with a picture of the man that they were hired to kill. And Rivera overheard phone calls between Garcia and this defendant during the trip, which included the defendant instructing him what needed to be done and saying things like, make sure you do everything right. Don't do anything stupid and call me when you're done. After hearing this, law enforcement began to further investigate and they looked for evidence that could corroborate what Luis Rivera was saying. They checked to see you know, whether these calls took place, whether the meetings took place. Luis Rivera also told them lots of kind of small details about their time in Tallahassee and law enforcement looked for evidence to corroborate that as well. First, police checked these cell phone records. They saw evidence that corroborated Rivera's information about the June trip. In fact, cell phone location showed that the defendant helped Sigfredo Garcia rent the car for their June trip to Tallahassee and showed that the defendant and Sigfredo Garcia were in communication throughout the June trip. On the second and final trip to Tallahassee, which was in July of 2014, Luis Rivera says that the two returned in Tal to Tallahassee, this time in that rented Prius. Rivera says that he and Garcia followed Professor Markell to the daycare, waited for him outside the gym, followed him home. Garcia got out, shot Dan Markell, hopped back in the car, and Rivera drove away. And I mentioned earlier that the evidence showed that both men had their phones off around the time, turned them off when they were leaving Premier, kept them off until after the murder once they were already southbound back to Miami. 
And Rivera said that that was the case and that the first call, though, that either of them made after the homicide was once they turned their phones back on and it was from Garcia to the defendant. And in that call, Garcia said the job was done. She said, I know. And Garcia asked about the money. And the defendant said, don't worry about the money. I'll get the money. You'll get it tomorrow. Law enforcement checked the cell phone records and locations and saw evidence that, again, corroborated what Rivera was saying. The defendant was in communication with Garcia throughout the July trip to Tallahassee. Sigfredo Garcia did, in fact, turn his phone off the morning of Dan Martell's murder, turned it off again while they were near Gainesville on the way back. And the first call that he made once he turned his phone back on after the murder was to the defendant. Law enforcement, I'm sorry, Luis Rivera told police that the next day, meaning the day after the murder of Dan Martell, money was delivered to him by Garcia and the defendant, and that the money was packaged in a very unusual way. The money was in stacks of $100 bills that were stapled together. And when police looked at the cell phone evidence, the record showed that the defendant did, in fact, drive from Charlie Adelson's home down to Rivera's home that morning, the day after the murder, which would be consistent with her getting the cash from Charlie Adelson and taking it to Rivera's home. The defendant repeatedly tried to call Sigfredo Garcia that morning to get in touch with him. And she and Luis Rivera actually called each other a few times that morning too, which you'll see was very unusual. And then the calls between all these parties abruptly stopped when their cell phone locations are all consistent with being at Rivera's place, which is where Rivera said they all met that morning and he received the stapled money. During this trial, you'll hear that Charlie Adelson had a very unusual practice of keeping his cash in stacks of $100 bills that were stapled together. And when you consider that the defendant delivered the money to Garcia and Rivera the day after Dan Martell's murder, that next day, Charlie Adelson's question to her about the next day when everybody was there in the Dolce Vita recording makes a lot more sense. Please pay close attention to all of the evidence that y'all see and hear during this trial and you will see that the defendant is the connection, the link, the middleman between the people who came to Tallahassee to commit this murder and the person or people who were willing to pay to have Dan Martell killed. This defendant's decision to what would benefit her in the short term took the life of a brilliant father of two little boys and caused a lifetime of loss for his loved ones. And at the end of this trial, you'll be convinced beyond any reasonable doubt that this defendant is guilty. It is not reasonable to believe that she did not commit these crimes given all of the evidence that you will hear and see in this case. She's guilty of hiring Garcia and Rivera to come to Tallahassee and murder Dan Markell on Charlie Adelson's behalf. She's guilty of conspiring with Charlie Adelson and Garcia to commit this murder. And she's guilty as a principal of the first degree murder of Dan Martell. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dugan. Ms. Kawas. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. May it please the court, opposing counsel, members of this jury. This is the first opportunity that I have had to speak with you directly, so I wanted to take a brief moment to reintroduce myself to you. My name is Tara Kowas, and I, along with Christopher Decote, have the privilege and honor of representing Catherine McManamy in this case. Now, I want to be.